that made it out. We're going to be in Mark chapter 6, picking up our study in verse 14 this morning. Verse 14. We're going to read through verse 29, just to warn you, a little bit of a lengthy passage, but please stay focused to the narrative here. Mark chapter 6, verse 14, it says, And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And, he's, and that's talking about Jesus. It says, And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John, and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto her, Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have have him killed, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Verse 21, And when he had a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, his captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it to thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it to thee unto half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry. Yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison. And brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word this morning. Father, thank you for this book of Mark. Lord, you've convicted me as I read this story. This amazing story, Lord, a very sad story. And yet, Lord, you made clear to me the truths that are here that we need. So, Lord, I pray this morning that you would do a work. Remove any distraction that I would cause, and please proclaim your word this morning. Do a work in our hearts and in our lives through your word. We trust you for this, and I ask this in your son's name. Amen. As many of you know that... uh, about six years ago, Misty and I quit, I quit my job and moved to South Carolina to attend seminary, and I was there for four years. And when I got there, I was very excited to do some hunting. As most of you know, I'm a big hunter, and I was very excited to do some hunting in a different part of the country. And I discovered that the deer in South Carolina are really small, very small deer. They're kind of pitiful. But So I was very excited to do some hunting, and I remember the first time I went hunting with a friend of mine, we went out early in the morning, and we were heading into the woods to some stands he had set up, and I remember seeing my friend in the dark, I saw him grab a stick, and as we're walking through this wooded forest, he was holding this stick in front of his face as we walked in the dark. I thought, that's really odd. I thought, but, you know, I'm not from South Carolina, I don't know what he's doing. And about 30 seconds later, I I moved over away from walking behind him, and suddenly this giant spider web hit me in the face, and I felt a spider crawling on my head, and I quickly brushed it off. And so I realized why he was carrying a stick in front of him, because the woods in South Carolina are full of spiders, particularly the spider that you see on the screen right there. I would tell you the name of that spider, but I could not pronounce it, so I just decided not to tell you 
But that right there is the spider. They're very common. They're about the size of a quarter. They're very large and scary looking. They're actually harmless to humans. But they are all over South Carolina. And I learned that when you walk through the woods, especially in the dark, that you don't, you know, you want to have something in front of you to catch those spider webs. Have you ever seen a really big spider web and taken the time to look at how amazing they are? It's really amazing that these spiders can create this web out of this very fine material that is actually very weak. Each strand is very weak. And yet the way that it is webbed together, it creates a trap that can catch moths and other insects for them to eat. I've titled today's message, The Web of Sin. Because what we're going to see in this passage is that when we commit sins and we don't repent of those sins, what can happen is we can layer on sin after sin after sin, and we can become entrapped in a pattern of sin. If you're taking notes this morning, I want us to see four lessons about unrepented sin Four lessons about unrepented sin. The first thing we're going to see this morning is that unrepented sin leads to fear and paranoia. Unrepented sin leads to fear and paranoia. Please look back with me at verses 14 through 16. It says, And, the king, and king Herod heard of him, talking about Jesus, for his name was spread abroad, and he said, that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Let me fill you a little bit in on what's going on here. We've been reading through the book of Mark. Jesus' ministry is growing, and he's even sending out his disciples, and his fame is spreading, and the word. Of course, they didn't have a phone. They couldn't just pick up and talk. They didn't have the news. But the word of mouth is spreading throughout the land of Israel that Jesus is performing miracles. He was casting out demons. He was raising the dead. He was healing many, many people. And so the word is spreading around about Jesus, and people are unsure of who he is and what he's doing. And the passage tells us here about Herod, that Herod assumed that this was John the Baptist that had risen from the dead. Now, the way this passage lays out, it's kind of giving us the backwards information. It, it's, it's, you're going to see as we go through it, but it's telling us what John assumed. And then the rest of the passage is going to go back and tell us what happened and how, and how Herod got to this point. But when we enter this passage, what we find is Herod is so fearful and paranoid that when he hears about Jesus, he goes, oh, it's John the Baptist. Now, we could glaze over that, but that's pretty significant that the king of this area at this time immediately assumed that Jesus was John the Baptist. Why? Why did he assume that? Well, we're going to understand it as we move through the passage more. But to put it simply, the reason he thought that was because he was responsible, as the passage said, for beheading John... And so now he's living in a state of fear and paranoia because it said that he believed that John was real, that John was holy, that John was from God. And yet, because of his unrepented sin, he ended up beheading John. And now, because of his sin, he's living with a fear that John is going to come back from the dead. That wouldn't be a very good way to live, waiting for somebody you killed to come back from the dead. Fear can have all kinds of negative effects on our mind and on our body. You've probably heard of stories of people who committed a serious crime, maybe murder, and they didn't get caught. And as the years go on, one of two things usually happens. Either they eventually turn themselves in because they can't take it anymore. Or when they are finally caught, they've interviewed many of these murderers that are caught later. And you know what they often say? They were relieved to finally be caught. Because they've been living in a state of dread their whole life. 
in fear of what the consequences would be of the things they had done. It's interesting how our minds work and, and how we, we fear consequences when we're living in doing sins that we know we should not be doing. When I was in law enforcement, I was a, a conservation officer, and I remember in our training, one of the men said, you, you have to pay attention to people's eyes because people's eyes will show you what they're hiding. I thought, really? And once I got in the job, sure enough, it was true. There was countless times where I would be interacting with somebody and they'd be acting nervous and I would talk to them. And as soon as we took a break in the conversation, they would glance over at something and then look back. I remember one particular time I was checking a fisherman. He was out in the boat and I was checking his fish and his live well. and, And I was making sure he didn't have any undersized fish or over limit. And the guy was acting very nervous. And I checked his fish and they were all legal. And I thought, why is this guy acting so nervous? And he kept glancing down. He would talk to me, and then he'd glance down at a, at a tackle box he had sitting there. He'd glance down at it and look back. So finally, I said, hey, why don't you hand me that tackle box right there? When he lifted it up, there was a baggie, and there was an undersized walleye that he was planning on taking home to eat. I caught him. His eyes gave it away. His son, he didn't even realize he was doing it, but that's because he was fearful that he was going to get caught for what he knew he was doing wrong. We have a way when we know we're sinning, when we're living unrepentant lights, where if we don't deal with our sin, it lives to a life of fear and paranoia about the consequences. And that's where we find Herod in this story right off the bat is he's making this ridiculous assumption about Jesus, but he's doing it because he had unrepented sin. He had a life of fearing the consequences of what he had done. So we begin this passage where we see a person who's living a miserable existence because he had not dealt with his sin. The application for you and I, and we're going to hit on this throughout the morning, is the question is, the admonition to us is, we must repent of our sin. We must not let our sins go unrepented. Let's see the second truth we're going to see as we dig in to the storyline here. Number two is, being confronted is an opportunity to repent. Being confronted is an opportunity to repent. Look over at verse 18. It says, for John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Now let's think about this. Who was John the Baptist? John the Baptist was a a prophet. He was Jesus's cousin. We know from scripture that he was a little bit of a wild man. He lived in the wilderness. He wore camel's hair. What was his main food he liked to eat? Locusts. I don't know how many of you are having locusts for lunch today, but uh, that's pretty wild. He was this wild man, and he preached repentance in the wilderness, and he drew great crowds. And, And apparently the news had got to Herod, and so Herod goes out to see him. He goes out to listen to him, and he's interested. And look at verse 20. It says, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So Herod goes out, and he's actually liking John. He goes, this crazy man, he's, I think he's right. I think he's righteous. I think he's actually, he's not so crazy. I like him. I'm listening to what he says. So interesting. But things take a turn when John gets personal. John turns to Herod, who is the king, and says, Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Whoa! That's bold, isn't it? That's really bold. That would be the equivalent of if I'm sitting here and the president, one of the presidents of the United States came in and sit down, and I just paused my message and started railing on the sins of the president. I think some of you would probably shrink in your seat, wouldn't you? That would be awkward. That's what's going on here. And I've got to admit, I admire John's boldness. I admire him. He says, this is wrong. You're in sin. He's confronting Herod with what he had done. 
And you know that this was an opportunity for Herod. Again, Herod, to some degree, believed that John was from God. And then Herod confronts him and says, you're in, you're in sin. This was an opportunity for Herod to make a change. He could have, he could have repent, said, you're right, repented of that sin. Brought his wife back to his brother and said, I was wrong. He could have, he could have solved this issue, but he doesn't do that, did he? He didn't do that. You know, being confronted by a person or by God about our sin or the Holy Spirit convicting us, it's not really fun, is it? How many of you just love getting under conviction? It's just the best thing. It's not fun, is it? When you come into a church or you're reading your Bible or you're here, you're in Sunday school and something is said and the Holy Spirit says, hey, buddy, that's you. Hey, buddy, you're doing that. That's wrong. You're living in sin. And if you're here today and you're saved, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And this is something we have often is we get under conviction from the Holy Spirit. That's not an enjoyable experience. But do you know what it is? That is an opportunity for us. That is an opportunity for us to then repent of our sin and deal with it before God. Think about it with me. We're talking about a web of sin. We're going to get into this passage, how sin builds on sin and creates worse and worse consequences. So what that means is that when the Holy Spirit knocks on your heart and convicts you about something you're doing wrong, that is gold. Because that is a wonderful opportunity to deal with what you are doing. It's God's gracious working in your life to warn you, you need to deal with this. You need to address this issue. And yet so often, we don't like that conviction. It's, we need to recognize what it is as believers. When the Holy Spirit knocks on our heart and tells us, you're living wrong, you're doing this wrong, that is God's gracious gift to us. It's God's gracious opportunity for us to repent and to grow. Imagine with me that you take your car in for an oil change. I think most of you probably do that, hopefully. Your car won't run very long if you don't. But I know many of you have taken your vehicle in for an oil change, and the mechanic comes out with that look on his face. I always dread that look, meaning there's something else wrong. Imagine he comes out and says, hey, your brakes are getting pretty bad. You're going to need some new brakes soon. You go, oh, okay, yeah, I'll take care of it. And you get in your car and you drive away and you think, ah, he's just trying to sell more work, which they do do that sometimes. So you take your car and three or four months later, you go in for your next oil change and the same mechanic comes out and says, hey, just so you know, your brakes, they're really getting bad. Do you want to schedule an appointment for that? And you say, no, I'm a little tight on funds and, and I, I've got to get to work and I'm not going to worry about it. So you pull away and three or four months later, you bring your car in and the mechanic changes your oil and he comes out and he says, listen, I would not drive that car anymore. You are metal to metal. Something bad could happen. And you say, no, I'm good. It's just not good time for me right now. And you pull out of the parking lot and you're driving down the road and you push on the brake and there's no brake. And you hit the car in front of you. And now your car's totaled and you're hurt. And whose fault was that? Now the mechanic maybe was trying to make money, but you know what? He was also graciously warning you. You need this for you. This isn't for, for me. It's for you. You need this done. That is a gift to you that he cared enough to tell you that. When people come into our lives, when God uses people in our lives to come to us, to maybe share a concern. When you walk into this building and you sit in here and you hear me preach or Pastor Snyder preach. When you come into Sunday school and God takes his word and he tells you, hey, you need to deal with something. That is an opportunity. And as Christians, we need to grow to look at it as an opportunity and to make changes in our lives. That's why the book of James tells us and commands us to not be hearers of the word only, but to be doers. Christian, when God is confronting you with your sin, just like John confronted Herod and said, you're wrong, this is wrong, it's an opportunity. Don't just walk away. Do something about it. Deal with it. 
take that opportunity and get right with God. Let's see the third thing we're going to see. Suppressing conviction makes things worse. Suppressing conviction makes things worse. Look at verse 17. It says, For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison. For Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. So actually, John didn't get too upset here. Or I'm sorry, Herod didn't get too upset. So John corrects Herod. Herod's not too upset about it, but he doesn't do anything about it. He doesn't fix the problem. But guess who does get upset? His wife, Herodias. She's mad. She's mad. And so he, instead of repenting of his sin and correcting it, he listens to his wife and he arrests John and puts him in jail. Remember, Herod believed that John was to some degree from God, that that John was a prophet. But because he didn't deal with his sin when he had the opportunity, and he's listening to his wife, now he has arrested John and put him in prison. This story single-handedly disproves the saying, happy wife, happy life. Now, little side note, that saying has some truth to it because the happiness of our wives should be important to us men who are married, and so we should pursue their happiness. But there are times where as men we need to be spiritual leaders and we need to do what's right even if our wives don't like it. Amen, women? Amen. It goes both ways. Okay, that was just side advice, not part of the message. That part was free, okay? But what happens here is is Herod's confronted. He's given an opportunity to repent. He doesn't do so. Instead, he listens to his wife that should not be his wife, and he puts John in prison. Does that help the situation any? No, it doesn't. It doesn't help at all. And yet, this is what we often do even as believers, is when God confronts us about something, we often suppress that. We can suppress it in many ways. I've known some people who are even claim to be Christians that they get under conviction and they just stop coming to church. I've known people that they get under conviction and they just start justifying their sin in their mind. They start focusing on the, the flaws of everyone else. Some people just... They get under conviction, so they just get busy doing something. Maybe it's even serving God. They just get busy. Instead of dealing with the issue that God is working in their heart about, they just find something to distract them. Christian, I can promise you that if God graciously confronted you about a sin in your life, that some pressing that conviction is not going to help. It is only going to make things worse. It's not going to improve the situation. I'm thankful. I'm thankful that we have a long-suffering God, don't we? And he does not punish us immediately. He is gracious and merciful and long-suffering. And maybe you've been suppressing some conviction in your life, and God gives you time after time, and he'll convict you again and again. And that may happen. But you know what? It may not happen. It could be that You don't have any more opportunities to deal with the issue that God's been convicting you about. Can I just encourage you today? If the Holy Spirit is doing a work in your life, do not suppress it. Do not suppress it. It is a gracious gift from God calling you back to himself. Let's see the fourth and final thing we're going to look at this morning. This fourth truth about unrepented sin and the web of sin we're going to see here is that unrepented sin leads to more sin. Unrepented sin leads to more sin. I know it's a little lengthy, but I want us to read verses 21 through 29 again and, and see what happened after Herod refused to repent and get right with God. It says, and when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of of Galilee. And when the daughter 
of the said Herodias came in. So this is his his wife that he should not have married. Her daughter came in and danced and pleased Herod and said, please Herod and them that sat with him. And the king said unto the damsel, ask of me whatsoever thou wilt and I will give it to thee. So she comes in and does this dance that's obviously not appropriate for this young lady to be doing. And the men are pleased. And him being king, he, he makes this promise. Hey, if you want anything, I'll give it to you. Verse 23. And he swear unto her, whatsoever thou shalt ask me, I will give it to thee under half of my kingdom. Stupid. Stupid thing to say. Verse 24. And she went forth and said unto her mother... What shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. Get this verse, verse 26. And the king was exceeding sorry. Yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king set an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. I want us to see a progression here. First, we have a sin of lust. Now, we don't know all the details that went into Herod marrying his brother's wife, but we know it was unbiblical, it was wrong. So we have a sin of lust, of covetousness, that is confronted directly by John the Baptist. And what does he do? He doesn't deal with that conviction, he suppresses it. And now, a later period, some time goes by, John is in prison, and here he's having this birthday... And what sin does he fall into here? He begins lusting again. He's allowing his ungodly, immoral desires to cloud his judgment. And so he makes this promise to this young lady that he should not have made. He should not have put her in that situation. He should not have participated in this. But he does. And out of this lust, he makes this stupid oath. And then she comes to him and asks for John the Baptist's head. And now he's trapped. He's trapped. And so because his sin has created a web and has trapped him, he went from committing lust and covetousness to lust again. And now what does he do? Murder. Folks, that is what sin does. It starts small and innocent and unimportant. And if we don't deal with it, it grows and it grows into more sin and more sin. And before you know it, maybe you won't kill somebody, but you'll be in a place that you do not want to be. There's a saying, and I think it's very true. Many of you know it. It says, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. Look again at verse 26 with me. Look at this. And the king was exceeding sorry. He, he, it says he liked John the Baptist. He ended up killing somebody that he liked. Why? Because of the web of unrepented sins that he built and he had an opportunity to get right with God and he failed and it led him to committing murder. For those of you that know your Bible, who does this remind you of? David, right? Did not King David allow lust in his life and then lies and then deception and he ended up murdering somebody? You may read this story and think, well, that's Herod. He's not saved. He's ungodly. This doesn't apply to me. I'm a Christian. David did the same thing. David was the man after God's own heart. And he fell into a web of sin that led to murder. Folks, unrepented sin leads to more sin. 
a sad story, isn't it? We didn't even talk about John the Baptist. He's the one that got killed. We didn't talk about him much this morning. Of course, God had ordained this. This was all in God's time. John had fulfilled his ministry. But when we see this man, we see how sin can be so deceptive to us. And how God can give us opportunities to deal with it. And when we don't deal with it, we end up doing things and being places that we do not want to do and to be. So as we close, I just want to ask you some questions to consider your own life right now. First, to the believers in this room. I want to ask you, is there unrepented sin in your life right now? Is there bitterness that you're holding towards someone? Is there fear that you will not let go of? Is there a habit, a daily activity that you've been doing that God's been convicting you about that you have not stopped doing? Have you hurt someone that you love and you are refusing to go and apologize and deal with it? Can I just encourage you, if you're here today and the Holy Spirit's been knocking on your door, your heart's door about something, can I encourage you to make it right today? Because when we don't, we can end up doing things and end up in places we do not want to be. I'm so thankful that scripture says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Scripture knows we're going to sin. We're all sinners. Even those of us here that are saved, we're born again. We're still sinners, aren't we? And so we need to go to God. If you're here today and the Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart, there's really four steps. I'm going to, I'm going to briefly go through them. Number one, you got to be honest with God about what's going on. If the Holy Spirit's knocking on your heart about a sin in your life, to, in a little bit, you're going to get an opportunity to pray. Be honest with God and say, God, I did this. It's a sin. Number two, tell God you're sorry and that you don't want to do that anymore. Number three, ask God to forgive you and to help you to have victory over that sin. And fourthly, and this is the hard one. If you've sinned against somebody else, you need to take care of that. You need to call them. You need to go to them. You need to deal with that with that person. It's not easy, is it? The prayer part's easy, but dealing with those you've sinned against is hard. But how important is it? And what a great opportunity God is giving you by knocking on your heart's door. Lastly, if you're here today and you're not saved, you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It is very possible that God is also knocking on your door about your sin. But if you're not saved, it's not a matter of going to God or going to people just for forgiveness. You don't have a relationship with God. He's not your father right now if you're here and you're not saved. We become God's children when we acknowledge we're sinners, when we recognize what Jesus did on the cross, when we come to him and in faith we say, God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and save me. I believe that Jesus Christ paid my punishment. That's what we call around here the gospel, the good news, that God sent his son to die for your sins, the free gift of salvation. But if you're here today and you've never done that, you've never humbled yourself, repented of your sin, and placed your faith in Christ, please do that today. It is the most important thing. I don't want you to leave this place unless you know for sure that you have a relationship with God. That you know for sure that if you died today, that you would be with God in glory. So if that's you, if you're here today and you're not saved, I beg you. Please come see me, see Pastor Snyder. Let us, we're just going to, it'll take 10, 15 minutes. We'll take you in a room, you and, and, and our spouses, and we'll sit down. And we just want to clearly show you from Scripture how you can know for sure that you're saved. Please do that today. But for the rest of us and the majority of the people in this room who are saved, today's an opportunity. 
God ordained that I preach this passage this morning. It's an opportunity for you to deal with sins in your life that the Holy Spirit has been working on you. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes and talk to the Lord. After I pray, when I'm done praying, the piano is going to play for a few minutes. I want you to do those things. If, if the Holy Spirit's convicting you about something, I want you to be honest with God. Tell him you're sorry about it and ask him to forgive you. If you're saved, this is not so you can go to heaven. This is to restore your walk with God, your relationship with God. Do that this morning. Father, thank you for being long-suffering with us. Lord, you know that we're dust. You know that we're weak. You're, you pity us. You're gracious towards us. Thank you for that, Father. But Lord, no doubt there's many in this room that you've been convicting, that you've been talking to about doing something. Maybe it's getting baptized. Maybe it's restoring a relationship. Lord, you've been working in hearts. Lord, let this be a day today where we stop resisting and we come to you and get things right. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in this room who's not saved, that they would get saved today. Bless this time ahead, Lord, as we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. The piano's going to play a couple verses. I want to give you some time. The altar is open if you want to come forward, but you can pray in your seat, talk to God, and deal with what he is leading you in your heart to deal with. Amen. Thank you for your good attention this morning. We have a long-suffering God, don't we? But let's take advantage of the opportunities he gives us. When he convicts us, when he works in our lives, we do not want to take that for granted. I'm going to be here for a while today. If any of you want to speak with me or need, need counsel or anything, if you're not sure you're going to heaven, please come talk with me and my wife, Pastor Snyder and Cindy, and uh, we'll be happy to pray with you and talk with you. Just thankful you're here today. I hope the word is making a difference in your life. Pastor Snyder, would you dismiss us in prayer?